I've been thinking about Duke Ellington a whole lot. I've been thinking about New World of Coming, which is a piece of music he wrote to express this vision of hope for a new world. But he says, I visualize this new world as a place in the distant future when there would be no war, no greed, no categorization. When I'm listening to your democracy suite, that is that part of hope and, you know, faith that we can do better and change and make a new world order? Yeah, my stuff is always like that. I mean, that's what the art itself is, even if you don't say that. You play for improvement. If it's your self-improvement, then the improvement of the group, then the audience, then the culture you, you live in, that's what you're doing. So you have to fight for the vision and dream of the world that you have and make that be a reality. Don't just succumb to a, a negative mythology. But it's a battle. It's not a matter of putting a smile on something. You got to plant that flag on the cliff, that's what it is. Well, the first movement of Democracy Suite, Be Present, right? It's been hard to be, it's been challenging to be present this year, obviously, from the confines of the living room. But I feel like artists are doing it. And I hope that everybody will ascribe to this notion that, it, that that's the job. You know, as you say, that's the job is to keep, keep fighting with, with your notes and your words and your actions every day. Yeah, and those that are doing it are doing it. And those that are not doing it are not doing it. There's always a, a polarity, a tug, a give and a take. And then the electricity that comes from the friction of those two things, that's the, that's the actuality that we live in. You know, it's like a friction. It's hard for us to figure out anything. It just, there's a lot going on, you know. There's a lot going on. Yeah. I think there are plenty of artists who don't believe that the work that we do makes a difference. And I don't know, maybe jazz is probably a healthier place in that regard because it's new, it's evolving always. I feel like, you know, for me in the classical side of things, I'm not sure that mission is ever ever very much taught as part of what we do. You have to assume that mantle all by yourself. Yeah, you probably, you know, better than me, but I feel like, you know, just <clears throat> all the people that work to keep orchestras gro- going, all the composers that write, all the students that study, all of the, it's such, a, such an abstract pursuit in a time like ours that a community of people sit in a concert hall and listen in silence to some music. And that's a deep library that they're playing too. And that library has many people who've thought very deeply on significant subjects. And that it has been kept going. Carlos Strina's music is played, Bach's music is played, uh, Vivaldi's music is played, Handel, Berlioz, Wagner. I think the whole system is a kind of belief in civilization. And, and then when you go in these directions, sometimes you can go to become too elite or over-refined, but that's, that's the same as being overly ignorant. But when you find that middle space that communicates with people that is sophisticated, that is refined, and still has that earthiness and a down home, there's still an still audience for it, and it's still life-changing. So I think, you know, in jazz, much of the time, our musicians are also imitating the European tradition. And jazz has many uh, struggles that are connected to America and to American, the American form of racism and the American identity, which we struggle with. There's always some, a set of variables, that some work to our advantage and some don't. And we have to negotiate through those variables to deliver our mission, whatever we consider it to be. Well, it's the believing in the human. And I, I think that right. in the classical, in the concert tradition, there's this clear and present danger of forgetting about the human in it, you know, <laughs> turning the humans into statues, turning this canon into something fixed and unbending. And so this is what I say all the time when I'm talking to younger musicians, forget about genius. I don't care about genius. <laughs> I care about human. That's what resonates across centuries. I mean, this big question about why music and the arts become so insular and so excluding of so many people. You know, we need better education. Like, even if I look at a football game, somebody's telling me what's going on. Mm-hmm. And that's much simpler than Bach. Who is Duke Ellington? I mean, I don't even know how to put him in a context. So you know from all the fantastic playing and activism that you've your, your entire time out here, you've been doing it. And you're doing it right now. We don't have music appreciation for our listeners. We just sell them products and we expect them to be a certain way. That's unrealistic. Then we don't have any arts education by and large. So let's say you could access jazz through another art form if you were taught as a student. We dismantled our our music education, music appreciation. Remnants of it remain, but we struggle with it during the Depression. Then when Sputnik and the whole kind of science revolution and science and math are the only thing that makes you educated. That was the dismantling of other things, music and music. 
none of this is important. We have to, we're, we're fighting against the Russians and they're doing these things. They have scientists. We have to do that. No, you just, you don't have an arts relationship. You have commercial products that are sophisticated that are being sold to you. Now they've, they've attached themselves in the 1950s to your teenagers and they're, they're developing sexuality. Now in the 1960s, the remnants of that start to get destroyed. You don't have any music appreciation. All these things are being dismantled. Now, jazz, that never started. There was never really any concerted national jazz appreciation. So we're doing well given the, the, the general populace in the, in the governmental lack of understanding of investing in the civic part of our lives. And the, the fact that we, you go to schools in our country, pro- public and private, it certainly is not meaningful. We would not be called a country of the arts. We're a country of the commercial. If you can make some money off of something, it's good. And we're a country whose standards have been declining forever. And it's like we've, we lost the ability to critique it. Yeah. It's almost like this is the definition of progressive. Really progressive thinking is what you're talking about. Last summer, you know, when all the, all the work was canceled and we were all sort of floundering and I had a lot of communities across the country where I was supposed to be doing my performing and, and community um, engagement work with youth. So I jumped on Zoom and it was very hard. We weren't doing it very well, but I was working with these kids at a school in Los Angeles called the Watts Learning Center. They were really struggling. They hardly had computers. They have their cameras off. And we we're just doing this very basic stuff. Music, draw a picture, listen to the music, just something to keep them engaged. Last week, I got an email from this little girl named Jayla. And she, she reached out. She said, Miss Downs, are you going to do those classes again this summer? A year <laughs> later. And it just made me think, oh, Jayla, you know, I, if, if you had just this little bit of bad something that I was able to provide for you every day of your life, where would you be? People want it. They just don't. They don't. Mm-hmm. It's like you want to eat good, but you'll eat a Big Mac. And it's always painful when you think of just how many kids we're losing. We have a tendency to think it's just if you're in Watts or if you're in the west side of Chicago or if you you could be in a suburb somewhere with people with a lot of money. The, the ignorance is still the same. We have a lot of work to do, but we can't give up on it. Our people deserve better than that. And we have enough of our ancestors who fought these battles for us to be confident to continue to, to, to fight them. I have a question for you about this year of protest. This was the, the most present and strongest collective protest I think we've seen in a long time. And you've seen certainly, you know, the ups yeah. and downs of American civil rights. And there were artists like John Baptiste who were taking the music out there, but I wasn't seeing music as sort of a collective language of protest this year. And I, I wonder why. Well, I think a lot of people don't feel the protests. If stuff is good for you, why are you, why are you protesting? Yeah, you but even to... the people who were out in the streets, there wasn't music. There wasn't, there wasn't a, you know, a, an organic kind of making um, the music. Every, everywhere I went, I saw people playing tambourines and singing and stuff. No. <laughs> I, mean, they had I was some at the wrong stuff. protest. <laughs> they, they, look, they had some funky stuff they were doing. Huh? I mean, you know how they had some hip chants? I mean, I went out. I went to check people out. and I would look at them on TV. They had some hip stuff. But, you know, we're connected to a popularism that doesn't have a spiritual component. When its songs come out, it's not going to be necessarily about protest. It might be attacking the police. It might have a target. But it's going to be using the N-word. It's going to be having some misogyny in it. And everybody's eating this. And there's something ironic to them about it. They're thinking, well, okay, these people are protesting and we're still doing this. But nobody has the courage to say something is wrong with this. Something is wrong with this. First protest in the 60s that, that I remember because of my age, that had a spiritual component to it. Yeah, You had like reverends and you had people, you know, Martin Luther King. There had a lot of things going on of very educated people mm. who were deeply engaged with a movement that had a spiritual upside. You didn't have people running around using the N-word and all that. The King wasn't doing it. I mean, I think the entire language of protest has changed and it kind of brings cir- full circle back to New World of Coming and to Obama, Yes, We Can. I think the language of protest isn't so much about we shall overcome. It's, it's about you. You do this. You change this. Not that, yeah, that's agency through victimization. The problem is so pervasive. 
even that, even that kind of sectarianism that we see by generation, by gender, by age, by sexuality, it's so, so sexualized, you really can't say anything about anything or you're going to offend some gang. You got your gang and you want to do great. You know, you want to police, fantastic. You want to talk about job discrimination, great. You want to talk about uh, uh, gender inequality, fantastic, that will help. You want to talk about, because we just are struggling in this time. And the United States is like a kind of testing ground for all of these things because we have a more diversity of people with agency than there, than there is in other places in the world. And when you create more agency for people, you create more protests and more discomfort because people want more and they should. But we just have to make sure that we get our mechanics up underneath these slogans. It's a lot easier to come with a slogan than it is to do all the work required to actually change the mechanics of systems. And these systems need to change. The laws need to change. The mechanics need to change. And I, I applaud anybody trying to change those mechanics. And sometimes you have to go too far in a certain direction to create the type of change you need to create. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're doing, if you're out there doing something, fantastic. I'm not critiquing you. <laughs> yeah, but you know? we as musicians, we know how to pull together. <laughs> we know how to we know how to collaborate and listen to each other and breathe together and do all those things. And, and we've been doing it. People been out playing. Musicians been out in space. And uh, I think for musicians in this time, just to play. And there's been a lot of pieces written, you know, about, about the Afro-American struggle, about uh, uh, women in consciousness. And we had trouble finding people who they would sing conscious things, but it'd be like a, a 1970s, ooh, mm, race relations. It would have to do with race relations. I mean, you know, it'd be like some song that sounds like it's the quiet storm and you're talking about race relations. But we find we have young people that, that are hungry. I liked what I saw of them getting out in the street and wanting to be a part of it. You know, let's do our part. And sometimes there's even people I disagree with. So I get somebody with a good opposite point of view that's willing to stand in public and defend their point of view. I'm with them. I don't have to agree with them. But show me some courage. Because this whole, this whole kind of sectarian way that people want you to just shut up and listen to them, nah. You need the dissonance to have the resolution, right? That dissonance creates that wave. That's right. <laughs> you know, I need to tell you something. I played in December a concert for the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas that was dedicated to your dad. The speech that you gave about your father just brought me to tears so much. And it made me, it, it gave me a lot of courage and a lot of hope and just a lot of gratitude for the ancestors. Yeah, a lot of people did a lot. We've had our turn and it's our turn to do stuff. And we, I mean, we've been out here doing it. You've been out here doing it. So, you know, we're we not, we not kids. I always used to say we're not kids, <laughs> we have kids. <laughs> so, you know, you've been out here doing it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and, and, you know, I'm proud of what you've been doing. And all the ancestors, you know, I'm just talking about just my daddy, every, everybody of all the races. And we have a long roll call of people that are in our ancestry. What can you say about it? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. 